Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining our street's event, Honest Perspectives on ESG and Liberty. I am Jerry Theodoru, the director of our street's finance, insurance, and trade program, and I'm delighted to be moderating a first class, first in class panel. Now, it's become trite to say that we've got outstanding panelists at just about every event, but you'll see that that would be an understatement as I introduce our three panelists in alphabetical order. And uh, please note that if you have questions, send them through the uh, Q&A feature of the, uh, of the event, just the Q&A, those questions will come to us. And this event is being recorded. So if you have to run out, you're securing the knowledge that you can get the, the full thing. Now I'll start alphabetically, Devin Hartman, is the, thank you, Devin, is the Director of Energy and Environment Policy at the R Street Institute. Devin's impressive history includes being president and CEO of the Electricity Consumers Resource Council, a national association of large industrial users of electricity. He's worked for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission, and the US EPA. He holds degrees from Iowa State University and Indiana University. Nick Loris is the Vice President of Public Policy at C3 Solutions. Prior to C3, Nick was Deputy Director of the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies and Herbert and Jane Morgan Fellow in Energy and Environmental Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Nick holds a bachelor's degree from Albright College and a master's from George Mason University. Thank you for joining us, Nick. Jennifer Shulp is the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Prior to Cato, Jennifer was a director in the Department of Enforcement at the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, commonly known as FINRA. And prior to FINRA, Jennifer was a lawyer in private practice at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher and a clerk for Judge E. Grady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. She has an undergraduate degree from University of Chicago and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Thank you, Jen, for being with us today. Let's start kick things off with a little bit of a definition. What is ESG? We know that it stands for environmental, social, and governance. But one thing that strikes me about the words that are in the acronym ESG is that they're adjectives. They're not nouns. So it begs the question, what is it? It doesn't reveal itself because these are adjectives. And there's a lot of definitions that are being thrown out there. And I'll give you about a dozen. There are probably more. It's a framework. Some call it a lens or a prism. Others call it an approach. Some call it a risk management strategy, or maybe it's a methodology, or is it an activity or a philosophy or an ideology or an investment style? So you got about a dozen different terms there. And there's also the term that's sometimes used synonymously with uh, ESG is ESG investing. What is ESG investing? It suggests that it's a different methodology, methodology of investing. Asset managers, analysts are looking at uh, fundamentals, price earnings ratios. So you've got fundamental analysis versus technical analysis, chart watchers that look for trends in, in, in prices. So is ESG a new investment methodology? So it can be any or maybe a combination of those dozen things. And then some of the more colorful characteriz characterizations of it ESG, as we look at the polarization of pro-ESG versus anti-ESG voices, is we have new terms come in. They call it, some call it an attack on free markets. Some call it anti-investor or a crusade in political culture wars. It's a liberal or left-wing agenda to some, or a progressive scheme pushed by left-wing elites, or it's woke ideology. Uh, Jennifer, I saw you were discussing with an NYU professor that says that it's baloney, or maybe it was another word that began with a B that he used, but this is being <laughs> recorded, so I won't say that it's anything but baloney. But on the other side, the, uh, the pro-ESG side will say that it's data. It's nothing but data. It's new information and new data for investment managers to consider, or it's looking at a wider range of risks and value opportunities that can have a material financial impact on investment performance. Or maybe it's a blueprint for companies to evaluate sustainability. So those are the, the terms that I picked out. And before we, we get into uh, the, 
history, the background of ESG. Uh, if anyone on the panel, uh, Devin, Jen, or Nick, have heard other words that uh, will merit inclusion into the uh, the long entry that'll be in the Roger's thesaurus for e ESG. Well, what am I missing? I'll give, I'll give you about a dozen, but have you heard anything else in terms of a, a pocket short definition? I'm mostly just surprised it took you so long to get to woke because uh, that's a, <laughs> you know, uh, it gets referenced so much uh, ad nauseum. Um, but no, I think that uh, really sums it up. But I also think it, it kind of sets the stage for how difficult some of these conversations can be just uh, because it means so many different things to so many different people. Uh, there's so much nuance involved in um, both ESG kind of as a as values and uh, ESG as value, which I know Jennifer has um, written extensively about. Right. So you have the definition of your choice and that has been exploited to support a view there. It's a, it's a moving target and it is what, what you want it to be. So the fact that it's so broadly defined and there's no consensus there it makes it difficult, but we're going to do our best in, in the next uh, 45 minutes to, to get something more solid. Uh, any any other thoughts on the, uh, the definition or the terms that are used to describe it? You know, this will jump into the, the history discussion a bit, but some of the ways in which it's been described is also kind of an outgrowth of the corporate social responsibility movement, and that ESG is just a new word for corporate social responsibility. Um, in the same way, it's been described as an outgrowth of the socially responsible investing movement, and that ESG is just a new word for socially responsible investing. Um, both of those things are different things. So uh, continuing the kind of conflict between what does this mean, but it, it kind of sets ESG in a little bit of a historical context um, compared to just what we're seeing today in 2023. Right. So uh, indeed, if social, socially responsible investing, uh, are you going to focus on the social or are you going to focus on responsible? Because the responsibilities of asset managers and investment managers are, are pretty much set. Um, yeah. But uh, Jen, do you want to comment a little bit more about, about the history and how this came out uh, of the woods in 2004, I think it was, and, and maybe why it's become such a hot button issue? Uh, five years ago, you wouldn't have heard much about this. Sure. So 2004 is kind of the birth of the term ESG. And unusually for an investment term, it was birthed by the United Nations, um, who we don't normally think about being at the forefront of what we're thinking on either corporate social responsibility or investing. And the United Nations put out a report that was the is an outgrowth of a couple of different initiatives, but also included a lot of financial institution input um, and started talking about the need for focus on ESG. What I say contributes to today's frustration with what does ESG mean is that ESG was not defined in that report and was recognized at the time that ESG could mean different things to different countries, to different parts of the world, and at different times. So ESG was a bit of a black box when it came about in 2004. Um, you hear today a lot of talk about how ESG plainly put forth by the United Nations is, is a plot to move money in a certain direction. And there's, uh, you know, towards favored outcomes, um, I, the idea of impact investing. And while that's potentially something that can have been read into the 2004 report, particularly with respect to the background and history of what the United Nations was working on, there's nothing definitive in that report that shows that ESG itself is meant to be a kind of social construct of how to direct capital. Um, and that's where we get to the point that it's unclear exactly what lens you're supposed to look at ESG through. Prior to 2004, there had been plenty of corporate social responsibility initiatives. And something that had been talked about was ensuring that companies were socially responsible. 
Um, that again could mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but we saw it in terms of say corporate donations, corporate philanthropy, um, and a little bit more focus internally at corporations on kind of what we would think of as stakeholder issues. Um, rather than shareholder issues. I'm not sure that divide is the right way to think about them, but when you think about corporations being responsible towards the environment or corporations being responsible towards their workers, I don't know that you can divide that out into that doesn't have a shareholder impact um, as easily as a lot of people would like to say, but that, that was the lens. Similarly, socially responsible investing is a concept that goes back far before 2004 and rests on the idea of kind of investing for impact in some way. And that is what we think of when we're talking about ESG today as values investing, where you would be willing to give up a little bit of return in exchange for a particular outcome. Um, you are investing, you're putting your money in specifically because you want that money to help save the whales, or you are interested in supporting companies that treat their workers in a particular way, um, understanding that that might not be the particular outcome that's going to get you the biggest returns. And socially responsible investing has taken any number of guises over the years um, on the left and the right. Um, for a time, biblically responsible investing was, was something that was looked at as well. So this concept of putting your money to work for your values also was not new. What was a little bit newer in 2004 was talking about specifically ESG integration and thinking about how ESG factors, say climate risk, um, or again, how a company treats its workers might affect the ultimate value of a company um, and thus be important in an investment analysis um, or in the company's own um, analysis of its valuation or its potential risks. But again, th that's not new either. Um, just talking about it as ESG is what was new. I would say Jerry asked kind of the why has it gotten so popular um, and why have we started hearing about it more in the past five years? Um, that's slightly difficult to attribute, and I'd be interested to hear if others have different viewpoints on this. But for me, one of the things that has made it able to gain in popularity is the fact that there is not a set definition as to what we're talking about here. So that ESG can be used as both a marketing term and, and as more, but in many different ways to attract investors or attract companies' boards or attract employees looking for companies. And the malleability of the concept itself is what's allowed for the rise of this acronym that kind of means nothing to become such an important topic of conversation. Yeah, and that's a lot, uh, Jen, but, but I'm afraid there, there's actually more. And maybe, maybe Devin, Devin, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, other guises, uh, positive screening, negative screening, and also divestment. I remember when I was in college and there were protests uh, to divest from South Africa, or, you know, we... Uh, wouldn't buy shares of a mutual fund that focused on South African gold mining. Um, so there's there's actually more there. Uh, Devin, do you have any thoughts on or want to explain to the audience what positive and negative screening are and where divestment might fit into that uh, spectrum? Yeah, absolutely, Jerry. So I, I think Jennifer really did a nice job of, of setting up like the backstory of how ESG kind of came to be. And it's this umbrella term that is so amorphous. <laughs> um, I might think about it in terms of digging a little bit deeper into specific ESG practices in the corporate sphere. So I'd kind of put it into two general kind of behavioral camps. One is investing, and we, we all know that one. There's also just corporate managerial practices. So how many companies you know, have a formal ESG policy internally that they use and implement? That's also a very important consideration. And so 
you know, as you noted with the apartheid example there, Jerry, or as Jennifer gave a note, firms have been accounting for environmental, social, and governance factors in their behavior for, for decades, well before ESG was even crowned an official term. And regardless of where that nomenclature goes long term, it's the, these practices are going to be here to, to stay in many types of um, uh, manifestations. And so going back to this investment and management kind of paradigm, I'd, I'd start to kind of dissect why ESG went from niche to mainstream in the latter half of last decade. So everyone wants to know how much of this is market versus government driven. And I don't know that anyone has the clear answer for you, but I'll provide a couple data points that give you an indication. I think based on our take, it looks like market forces were a huge driver last decade in sort of propelling things from going niche to mainstream. This is especially evident, I would say, where you look at business uh, behavior as a function of changes in a business milieu. So what we've seen based on survey data or revealed preferences is that consumers, investors, suppliers, employees at firms are increasingly concerned about the impact, either environmentally or socially in particular, of companies um, in, in, within the broader stakeholder community, that's kind of manifesting itself into some pretty profound preferences and, and financial preferences that is in labor markets and the ability to you know, the, attract uh, capital <laughs> and the cost of capital, a lot of these other forces. So we have um, what one, a couple of data points that I think are pr particularly telling is that all of these corporate constituents, right, that they account for, it's, we've seen a large shift generationally in preferences. Typically, baby boomers, it's kind of a subset who really cared about many of these things. Then Generation X kind of broke the door down a little bit. About roughly half care about this stuff, mm -hmm. and they're willing to change their financial behavior accordingly. A lot of finance firms said that was the generation that made us rethink what we were doing last decade. But then you get into you know the younger generations, millennials, Gen Z, and you're talking 80, 90 percent um, of, of a lot of these folks are willing to change their financial behavior based on environmental and social impact. So that's important. But going back to one critical distinction that Jennifer made is especially in the investing space, there's a there's we have to recognize that investing theses in ESG take a variety of forms. So some of these are just focused on enhancing pecuniary performance, right? Some of these are really focused on you know, values-laden approaches that really want to have an impact, and they may be willing to have a financial trade-off, as Jennifer alluded to. Those are profoundly different categories of investment theses, and it's really important to make that distinction, and which is why we shouldn't be labeling all of ESG investing <laughs> into one sort of broad brush bin. And so I think an important thing that, that, to kind of recognize is that there's a lot of shifts um, in investor preferences, as we've seen, within those two bins. One interesting data point is when you look at why a lot of asset managers started adopting ESG just in pecuniary only enhancement applications, I'd refer folks to an NYU uh, Stern study um, from a couple of years ago where they looked at over a thousand studies from 2015 to 2020 on how ESG affected returns. And what they found is that a lot of these um, ESG considerations, depending again on how the investment thesis is shaped, can actually enhance portfolio returns. And that explains why a lot of asset managers, again, based on their direct feedback, started to incorporate elements of ESG, like thematic risk management, into a lot of these portfolios. Now, that's very different from some of these ESG products that are oriented towards having an impact, but it's also good business to develop products that have those impacts. For example, Deutsche Bank surveyed their clients last year and was kind of shocked to find that 42% of their clients expressed an interest in that 42%, excuse me, were going to be willing to take a reduction of returns from 8% to 4% in order to have their portfolio invested in firms with AAA ESG ratings rather than C ratings. That is a profound <laughs> preference of a subset of their client base. Now, so, so to no surprise, the development of more of these impact investing tools um, makes sense to develop because there are elements of demand for it. So I think that's an important distinction. And then lastly, on one point on the, the managerial practices, 
the most prevalent form of, of corporate managerial ESG practices were really these climate commitments and disclosures that started to coming that started coming out in the, in the latter half of uh, last decade. What's really interesting about this is that seemed to be correlated with a decrease in the federal government's concern with climate matters. Typically, we always thought about like corporate environmental practices as sort of historically being done to kind of head off more draconian government intervention. And that's where most of the literature historically says it. But what we actually saw was that a lot of firms were actually proactively addressing and making pledges and developing action plans to reduce their contributions to climate change in the absence of government coercion. That was really interesting. But when the administration changed and, and, and uh, the Biden team came in, what we started to see is a lot of corporate surveys then started to cite anticipated regulation as the main driver of their ESG practices. So we've kind of seen over last decade a lot of market forces. And again, those market forces are actually growing. But with new shifts in federal um, uh, with, with, with the federal administrations, uh, we've seen uh, the regulatory agenda play a much more pronounced role in, in driving uh, corporate ESG behavior. And that's before we even get to the state conversation, which I think will come up a bit later. Yeah, thanks, Devin. And there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm glad that you, uh, you referenced uh, the NYU study because there are some studies worth looking at because we want to be speaking from data and from facts. And on the, uh, on the performance, uh, uh, there's a, a global ESG fund, uh, global ESG equity fund that has got an expense ratio of 1.3%. That's 130 basis points. And you've got comparable funds that are ETFs that are at 25 basis points. So you're sacrificing over a percent of, of uh, your, your assets and compound it over years. That's pretty material. So if you want to go for one of those, then you got to prepare to, to make less money. And then the study that I saw that was, was very interesting came out a few months ago uh, by uh, Kelly Shu at Yale and someone at Boston University looked at green firms versus brown firms and ESG principles driving the movement from investments in, in brown firms, dirty firms that have a, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, moving investments there, punishing them by removing those investments to green firms. And the counterintuitive result is that because so much money is flowing into green firms, the values are going up, but the returns are getting lower. So it not only feeds uh, green firms that have a very low carbon footprint, but there's nothing that can be improved environmentally with green firms like insurance companies or real estate brokers because they're not emitting greenhouse gas em emissions. So you know, looking at the numbers and what actually happens with performance is, is not a clear cut thing, but there are some, there's some information out there. But since we're focusing a lot on, on investing, this is in, in the investing world, there is, a, is, there is a concept that guides the behavior of investment managers, asset managers, financial advisors, uh, similar to in the medical field, there's a standard of care. If your physician is not, is not uh, practicing at the normal standard of care, if he operates on the wrong arm, for example, then he's liable to a malpractice suit. Medical professional liability is there, and it looks at whether the standard of care uh, is violated. But the concept in the investment world is is uh, sort of similar. So Jen, do you want to talk a little bit about what fiduciary duty is and fiduciary responsibility of of, of uh, asset managers, investment managers? I'd love to. Um, before I jump into that, I want to kind of put a footnote on the discussion about performance in the ESG space. And it's really difficult to compare apples to apples in this space. Um, so that where we've seen papers that come out and say that there are, there's better ESG performance um, for funds that are focusing on ESG, it's very important to spend time looking at how that's defined and what is actually driving the performance. Um, for a decent amount of time in the mid 2000s, tech firms, which have generally been viewed as very ESG friendly, were, were high flying um, for reasons that probably were not related to their environmental footprint or their social policies. 
um, as tech has fallen off, ESG performance has also appeared to fall off a bit. Um, so it's the the data on this is very hard to decipher. Um, a lot of it kind of assumes, makes assumptions up front about what is and is not ESG. And even where it's trying to rely on ESG ratings to make a determination as to what is and is not good ESG, ratings tend to disagree with each other because there's a lot of variation in that space. Um, that's all just to say that a lot of this is very murky, which actually gets me pretty nicely to my point about fiduciary responsibility of asset managers um, as to what they owe their clients. And when we talk about it in this space, there's two areas that have really gotten a lot of attention in the ESG space with respect to asset managers. One of those is pension managers, and the other is your run-of-the-mill investment manager. Um, both of those groups are subject to slightly different rules because pension manager rules are run by statutes, um, at least at the federal level, named ERISA, um, but also at the state level that um, define duties in a retirement income context. Um, asset managers are manage their duties are run by a different set of principles and rules um, that apply to their, their duty as asset managers. But generally, the same principles apply, which is the, the manager there is kind of the agent of the principles. And the principles are the ultimate beneficiary. In a pension, that's the pension beneficiaries. In an asset management context, that's the investor who gave the money to the manager to invest properly in the first place. And as a very general matter, both pension managers and asset managers are required to act in the best interests and at the direction of the people that gave them the money to manage. And that's where ESG has really been a major flashpoint because this distinction between value investing and values investing becomes very important. Um, if you're using ESG to determine whether or not a fund um, has value, what that value is going to be and whether that's in the interest of a pension beneficiary or an investor, then that generally falls within standard fiduciary duties that exist at this point. But if a fund is looking to sacrifice return in order to meet some sort of external value, it's a lot more complicated. Um, in the pension context, that's generally not allowed um, because the main goal of a pension is to ensure that the benefits are available for the person seeking the pension. In the asset manager context, it depends a lot on what type of instructions the investor has given to the investment manager. Um, and by given, maybe that perhaps means agreed to in terms of making the investment in the first place. So an investor who is investing in a fund that is upfront about the fact that they're going to be sacrificing returns to invest in an environmentally friendly way is perfectly within its bounds. That manager should invest according to the thesis that it's disclosed. But if a pension or if an asset manager has been clear that all they're trying trying to do is maximize returns, that raises a lot of questions about how ESG comes into play, both with respect to the actual investment decisions of the fund, but also the kind of corporate governance decisions of the fund in terms of the voting that the fund will do in the investment in the companies in which it invests. And that has been a major flashpoint um, in terms of asset managers, some of whom have had very vocal leadership, um, CEOs, um, and their voting records with respect to environmental or social issues and the justification of those investment, of those voting records as either enhancing value or enhancing values. 
Um, and this, I think, is going to continue to be a very important part of the conversation. In fact, we're seeing, as we're coming up um, in the month of July, the House Financial Services Committee has dubbed it ESG Month. Um, and is holding a series of hearings, many of which are going to be focused on the duties of asset managers to their investors, including the, the advice that they're receiving from proxy advisors about how to vote in on shareholder proposals. Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, scores, ESG scores. Some rating agencies and other companies and consultants are looking at ESG scores and how, how useful have they been? Well, Silicon Valley Bank had a very, very high ESG score. And we know what happened there to SVB. And if we look back at other companies that could have had high ESG scores, uh, the uh, the railway that had the crashes, uh, Enron and uh, other other companies where the problem was with really with the G, whereas most of the ESG debate and the interest of uh, observers and commentators is on the environmental, on the, on the E part. And another consideration for pension managers that differentiates them from other kinds of asset managers is the duration or the time frame, the horizon that they look at. The pension fund managers are looking 20, 30, 35 years into the future because people that are entering the workforce now are going to be retiring in 30, 35 years. So there's a difference in terms of the short-termism or versus long-termism, but the uh, other classes of, of uh, investors, investment managers, or registered financial advisors, and also consultants, um, they're also subject to the fiduciary duties of duty and of loyalty. So they make decisions that are in the best interest of their clients so that there's not self-dealing or there's not a conflict of interest where uh, they are uh, putting money into a fund that gives them a higher management fee, but they're doing things that are in the best interest of their clients. And as you said, Jen, consistent with the investment guidelines that are given to the investment manager, uh, the guidelines can include negative screens, like we don't want any gun manufacturers in our portfolio. Everything else is, is, is fine. We're looking for a, a, a four four uh, percent book yield or, or whatever um, and then yes yeah, so you got the duty of uh, care and the duty of loyalty and within that the duty of oversight so those that are fiduciaries have those kinds of uh, requirements just as physicians have to observe the standard of care and not violate that so we've uh, been talking a lot just about background and definitions and history mm -hmm. uh, so I'm glad that you, you got into it so deeply but now let's turn it to where this meets policy and see what are some of the policy implications at the federal level, at the state level, because there is quite a lot going on. And I'm very pleased that Nick has been following these, uh, these developments. So Nick, you want to kick off uh, the discussion on where this ends up on the policy side? Yeah, and there's certainly a, a lot of different directions to go on the policy front, both at the federal and the state level. And, and I think just to kind of put a bow on to what all three of you said, it, it, you can see how it's easy to craft a narrative of being anti-ESG or pro-ESG based on a, a number of these factors and then leading to a lot of these policy responses. Uh, you know, Different headlines can say, very different things about ESG from one day to the next. And, and because it you can't compare apples to apples, uh, it's very easy to kind of have that prejudice that you may have about ESG portfolios, about impact investing. Um, you, you could have those preconceived notions uh, and a story to, to support your argument. Um, and so in response, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of activity, you know, as Devin mentioned more recently at the, at the federal level, um, probably the the biggest uh, issue is um, you know the climate disclosure rules coming out of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, you know calling on uh, companies to disclose their climate risks, uh, you know everything from physical climate risks, uh, you know how extreme weather or sea level rise could impact uh, investment to um, different emissions, whether that's you know direct emissions or uh, what are known as scope two and scope three emissions, you know, how they uh, the, the kind of the indirect uh, energy use um, and, you know, uh, all the way up and down the supply chain. 
uh, how that impacts uh, investment decisions, um, disclosing risk on you know what an energy transition might look like uh, for uh, for institutions. Um, there's also um, you know contracting uh, changes about disclosure uh, with regard to federal contracting and procurement um, and disclosure of emissions um, for working with the federal government. Uh, there was uh, a, a recently finalized Department of, of Labor rule um, on ESG, and then there is certainly a lot happening at the state level. Uh, you know, both on the the pro ESG uh, and anti ESG uh, responses uh, at the federal level, and that that even in and of itself has a wide range of you know, policy responses as, at both the kind of legislative level, but also you know, kind of at the attorneys general level as well, where some states are you know, requiring ESG factors into state investments, while uh, many states, uh, I, I believe, um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many it is now, but I think it, it's above 20 now uh, that prohibit ESG factors in, in state uh, investments. Um, and, and then some states are, are going even further than that um, and restricting uh, investments for um, firms that have ESG policies or for firms that may choose to uh, not invest in uh, fossil fuels or oil and gas development or coal companies. Um, and then there's uh, states uh, like California and Maine who are um, promoting the divestment of coal and other fossil fuel industries. So, you know, just in that kind of short uh time span that we've had uh, in, in the last few years, you've seen uh, kind of this fragmented uh, ESG response, depending on what state you're at. And, you know, I think the, the common thread is it's almost like a horseshoe. It's kind of coming around uh, with the, the policy impacts on uh, the states, um, on the consumers and, and on the retirees in that it's restricting choice uh, and increasing costs in, in a lot of instances. I think what we've already seen from a number of studies that have analyzed what states have restricted uh, the use of uh, lending institutions in places like Texas is that it, it's limited choice and raised costs, it's raised interest rates, and therefore uh, you know, it, it's impacting the state uh, negatively. And I think to the extent that uh, states can't uh, can't actually um, factor in ESG, even when it may be material, runs uh, counter to uh, the fiduciary responsibility uh, that these retirement uh, managers have. And so I think in a, a rather short amount of time, uh, it's gotten pretty messy. Uh, I think maybe the, the saving grace is that there were a lot more uh, proposals uh, that uh, tried to be forced through within the last uh, year or so. I believe that there was uh, more than 150 in the past year. And, and I think uh, only 13% of them actually made it through. Um, and I think part of that was because of the recognition of the increased costs and paperwork and bureaucracy that this would impose. And it, it would have these adverse impacts on, uh, on retirees and on the pension accounts um, throughout these states. So Happy to take that in any sort of direction we want to go into, but there's a lot at the federal and the state level we can we can dive into. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And on the uh, SEC disclosure requirement, one of the complaints that we hear from companies is that they're just being asked for more and more disclosures and more reports. And and one of the uh, criticisms uh, that I'm hearing is that a lot of companies, especially publicly traded companies, are already producing environmental supplements that talk about their emissions. Um, so it's already there. But notwithstanding, we're seeing these requests for more information, maybe at a more granular level, coming through and making it onto the proxy statements where there are shareholder proposals that are voted on at the uh, annual shareholder meetings. So. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on whether the these kinds of data dumps and, and data calls are are uh, superfluous or, or not recognizing that there's already adequate disclosure made at, at many publicly traded companies because they anticipate that? Yeah, I think superfluous is is accurate. I also think just overly prescriptive. Uh, you know, I think one of the challenges is that it, by 
crafting a regulation that's overly prescriptive, um, as we've kind of had throughout this discussion today on ESG, uh, it, it just takes so many different shapes and forms and to try to have kind of a one size fits all approach um, it makes it very difficult for um, many of these firms to to abide by the regulation and actually provide the accurate and relevant information. You may be forcing these institutions to um, disclose information that they might not really have all that much confidence in. Uh, you know, I think if you're trying to project um, some of these uh, these climate risks in a relatively short amount of time, you know, it's it's not really what climate models and even, you know, disaster models were designed to do in some instances. And so therefore you might actually be providing bad information to investors. And so I think there's a number of unintended consequences, not just with the, uh, with the additional information that is unnecessary, but just the, those higher costs and, and potentially um, just giving investors bad information. And I know I didn't submit comments uh, on the SEC regulation. I think R Street and, and Cato did. So happy to, um, pass the baton on to Devin and Jennifer. Yeah, I completely agree that the, the one size fits all is a major problem when we're starting to think about required disclosures. But I wanted to take a step back from that even more and say that when we're talking about you know, public company disclosures, it's very important to keep in mind the SEC's scope of authority in the first place. And there is a lot of ESG and climate risk voluntary disclosure being made by public companies right now. But the fact that that disclosure is being made does not mean that investors are the ultimate um, target for that information or that that information itself is necessarily material to investors. And the SEC's limitations are in requiring information about kind of the company's financial condition. Um, so while customers, suppliers, environmental activists might be interested in granular information about a company's scope three requirements, uh, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that that information is something that's material to investors and thus within the scope of what the SEC should be requiring. And then we can take a step even further back from that, that if it's even if it is within the SEC's authority, there are enormous costs associated with the SEC's climate risk disclosure rule that really counsel, I think, against the type of granular disclosure that it's looking to make or looking to have public companies make. Uh, by the SEC's own estimates, it would almost triple the cost of doing public company disclosures. Um, for information that is, under any view, not the primary business line of any company or the largest risk that most companies face. So even if this type of information is within the SEC's authority to require, and I think there's serious questions about that, um, the costs associated with the type of disclosure that the SEC is looking for here are enormous and I, I don't think justified. Yeah, I think on the on the policy front, um, I mean, you all hit it hit it on the head on the SEC front. I might point a little bit more to the state policy developments because that's where thus far the rubbers really hit the road in terms of laws that have been passed and actually are having an impact in the marketplace. Um, it's really important again to focus on this like take home message that. The role of government is not really to be pro or anti ESG. We we need to have a much more like discerning conversation about the forms of ESG and the proper role of government. So you know Nick referenced uh, Texas as an example, and I'd also throw in Maine because both in 2021, Maine you know required divestment from fossil fuels and in, in those uh, public funds, and then. Uh, you know, Texas went with the, this so-called anti-boycott model that a bunch of other states, uh, red states, have entertained, and a couple have enacted something very similar to it, like Oklahoma. Um, and and as as Nick noted, a lot of this is actually very contrary to the stated purpose of enhancing financial performance. Um, and so again, we're seeing examples now where unfortunately a lot of red states are prohibiting forms of. ESG considerations that would be pecuniary focused and enhancing. And then a lot of blue states have been 
either enacting or considering enacting forms of values-based ESG imposed on the private sector and, and, and public pension returns. And so that's those are problematic directions. But I'd say one thing that we have started to see is an evolution and an understanding of these. So in particular, we've seen in the red states a recognition that a lot of the Texas you know, anti-boycott model approach is oftentimes raising borrowing costs by, in the case, one estimate in the Texas case, hundreds of millions of dollars per year. In the investment uh, you know, portfolio returns, a lot of states that have contemplated anti-ESG policy, their state financial offices come back and said, hmm, your returns may go down from six and a quarter to 5%. Boy, that, hits, that, that, that number gets you into the billions really quick. And so we've started to already see an evolution of a more refined approach in a lot of red states to say, all right, we're taking the skepticism of ESG and getting back a little bit more towards a nuanced focus of ensuring a laser focus of fiduciaries on maximizing financial performance, but then also like having this this conversation about is there any other role of government in transparency and information deficiencies, et cetera, that I think is a worthwhile one to have, both at the state and federal level. And I think the SEC is a good example where a lot of folks on the left and right can disagree on what the role of government is in shedding more sunlight on a lot of these disclosures, how much of this should be driven by private ordering on the voluntary front, because private markets have been migrating in that general direction, how much of this should be coming from financial regulators more in this space. But and the left and right are going to have sort of a reasonable range to disagree on that. But that's where the conversation needs to be. It can't be on this role of government to, to force feed or to prevent the private sector from adopting or not using uh, ESG practices. Yeah, so that, that's where we are today. And I wonder if uh, anyone, uh, Devin, Jen, Nick, have thoughts on where this is going, where, given the current trajectory, you see this going. I mean, I, I'm uh, concerned that the, the the battle is heating up and people are fighting the wrong battles. There are anti ESG proposals that have made their way onto companies' proxy statements, the uh, shareholder proposals, which require an enormous amount of work with no action letters, back and forth with the proposer of these of these proposals at the company and the SEC and the SEC typically uh, agreeing with the proposer. So now that you have about a thousand shareholder proposals, whereas a decade ago it was in the 200s and the anti-ESG proposals have mushroomed from 13 in 2020 to 88 in 2023. So it's not going in the right direction. And the clarity that we've been trying to achieve in the last 45 minutes something that's not out there and needs to be disseminated because this is a work of not just of influence uh, but education uh, uh, there's not a lot of understanding about this and unfortunately people talk past each other at the hearings a couple months ago uh, I don't think anyone was educated people were just promoting their their own views but um, I'll stop being uh, stop pessimism here and hopefully that someone will have a um, a ray of hope. Where, where do you see this going? Uh, what, what are some of the paths that it could take? Well, I'm not going to jump in and, and quash the pessimism because that's <laughs> just not my style. But I think that, you know, there's two different tracks that I see this heading down. And one of them is the pessimistic one. And that is because we're we're continuing to see, I think what Nick described very well as being able to put whatever narrative with whatever biases you want on top of this, um, on top of the concept of ESG. It, it speaks to everyone um, with whatever story you want to tell, which is somehow how we're seeing what was a niche investment and corporate governance concept being at the forefront of political campaigns, at the forefront of presidential campaigns. And I don't see that going away. Um, it's become a convenient cipher for a discussion about the culture war and a way to kind of graft culture war onto real life financial outcomes. Um, I don't think that grafting is necessarily shown in any sort of you know hard financial numbers, but it it makes for a nice narrative 
And we're going to continue to hear that narrative as long as it's getting play in the red states, in particular in the presidential campaign season. But on the positive side, this last year, state legislative sessions were not nearly as, say, didn't function with the lack of nuance that you might have predicted um, based on the political climate. There was a lot more questioning of whether anti-ESG policies are in fact a good financial decision, whether it is in fact simply substituting a different ideology in, in government decision-making, and, and a real push to look at this more from a free market lens instead of a political ideology lens. So perhaps I'm having some faith in the state legislators, um, having some faith in members of Congress in asking the tougher questions here that get at questions about principal agent problems, about fiduciary duties, about dissemination of information uh, to allow investors to make their own decisions on this front. Um, so I'll end on that, that slightly optimistic note that, that I think we've seen, we've seen better questions being asked, even if they don't often make the headlines out of presidential candidates' mouths. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add before I pass it over to Devin is that um, I agree with Jennifer and uh, you know, you have seen some important legislative defeats of very potentially costly ESG bills. I mean, Indiana is a notable example um, where uh, they voted down a, a bill that would have prohibited the consideration of ESG. And, you know, the state did a study uh, and uh, estimated that it would cost uh, potentially $6.7 billion over 10 years uh, should they have gone um, with that prohibition on the consideration of ESG factors. And, and so the, whether you um, agree with that $6.7 billion cost estimate, I know there's some uh, folks who had some quibbles with it, if it would have actually been that high. But I think the fact that there are these costs and we've seen them you know, retrospectively in the states that already have these, um, these prohibitions in place is a real red flag for folks who are considering these bills. And I think on the other side is on, on, on the forced divestment from fossil fuels is, is it actually achieving the targeted and, and out, stated outcomes that you want? Is it actually resulting in a reduction in fossil fuel investments or is that just getting scooped up by other, uh, other investors? And so you're not actually meaningfully like changing uh, emissions reductions or uh, reductions in fossil fuel use. So I think both from a cost standpoint, uh, there's a lot of red flags that have been raised that it seems like state policymakers are paying attention to, which is good, um, as well as I would, you know, challenge some of the stated environmental objectives from some of the both pro and anti ESG pieces of legislation and, and whether they've actually achieved their intended outcomes. Thanks, I'm feeling better already. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I think Nick highlighted there's there's a lot of learning effects going on here. So even though there's this is clearly a culture war and it's frustrating, I'd encourage all of us in the stakeholder community to stay patient, uh, keep your composure and really drill down on this. So we, we are seeing an evolution, I think, in a lot of um, state approaches to ESG. Much of it has been for the better um, because we are learning from a lot of our mistakes, sometimes painfully, but we are starting to learn, <laughs> as Nick pointed out. So you're, you're, you're looking at like, you know, statements from, say, um, Montana, North Dakota officials, or, or New Hampshire, you're starting to see a lot of this conversation about let's get back to really zeroing in on making sure that we're not sacrificing um, financial performance in these portfolios. Cool. That's a good starting point for a conversation. Um, so we're seeing that next iteration of, of state ESG policy that I think is getting a bit more focused and then getting a lot more of the, um, you know, on the other side of the, of the aisle, a little bit more of the focus on what type of returns we want to have this conversation on. And so I'd, I'd kind of point the policy directions in two fronts. There's direct policy implications. So Jennifer teed up uh, a few of them really well. You know, let's, let's talk about principal age and alignment for fiduciary standards in the age of ESG. Great conversation to have. Let's talk about the, the way to address information deficiencies and the proper role for limited government to cultivate more risk-informed markets. Um, and, and to the extent that we want to um, better measure environmental and social impact of things, so um, at least market participants are better informed. 
those are all great direct implications. I also think that there's some uh, clarification of property rights, especially as we start to see differentiated commodities evolving to better satiate a lot of the um, uh, preferences of evolving market forces. So that means we're going to also, in addition to the CFC, uh, SEC, have conversations with the CFTC um, and, and some other financial regulators about how to how to best approach that. And then I think there's also indirect policy implications. And you know, Nick and I do a little bit more with the E of ESG. And a couple of things that we've started to notice is that historically, free market environmentalism has only been very effective for very specific sets of circumstances, like local pollution problems. But it hasn't really worked for a lot of things like regional and global environmental problems. And that's often led us to the domain of having to support a lot of government intervention, or at least a lot of arguments for government intervention, because private capital markets are not environmentally motivated. What we're seeing is a fundamental shift that a huge chunk of market forces and civil society are converging directly on the business community to address a lot of these otherwise considered market failures. And I think we need to have a conversation about things about actually the liberty enhancing implications of this, where we say, hey, there is a limited role for, for government in those direct policy implications, but the indirect policy implications are things like we should be more focused on getting government out of the way in capital deployment if you want to drive emissions cuts. That's way more effective than a lot of conventional approaches to environmental regulation. And so for folks like Nick and I that deal in the environmental policy domain, there's a lot of really uh, exciting um, outgrowths for the liberty enhancing argument down the road. Yeah, and it's kind of ironic to see that the uh, some of the uh, anti-ESG elements are arguing for what is a liberty limiting solution by depriving investment managers from making choices that uh, may be related to uh, material risk factors. And forces on the left, uncharacteristically, are, are talking about uh, freer markets and, and more liberty. Uh, well, we come up about uh, to the hour. There's a bunch of questions that have come in, and I'll just uh, field uh, one of them. Uh, how are investment managers supposed to trade off short versus long-term returns while maximizing value for their investors. In other words, what is the appropriate time horizon when you're not talking about pension funds, but more run-of-the-mill asset management? How is that time horizon determined? And I would reply that, uh, as Jen said, the investment guidelines, the investment preferences are given for institutional investors. That's certainly the case. And then for individual investors, if you're talking about uh, 401k, you have the option of, of choosing a fund that turns into bonds by the time you hit the age of 60. Um, and you have uh, other funds that are much more aggressive. So it really comes from the preferences of the investor. Uh, it's not something that is, that is uh, mandated. Uh, and it, it varies. Again, fiduciary duty, you do what's in the best interests of, of the investor, what they're looking for, knock yourself out and do as good a job as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, for them, treat the money as if it's your own fiduciary duty. There's no dilution of fiduciary duty with uh, with what we've been talking about. It's it's still there. Those that just like doctors that make uh, medical malpractice mistakes that, that do uh, transgress the boundaries are subject to litigation, which is a good controller. If there's uh, any other comments and other questions, we will answer. Thank you for those. And uh, if you want to continue, uh, send questions to me or to Devin, and we'll get him out to the, our, our guest panelists. Uh, unless uh, you have any closing remarks, I want to thank our, our tremendous panel. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been a great, great hour with you. I look forward to working with you. There's much work to be done. And uh, I'm, again, I'm, I'm feeling good about what's available. So thank you. And also those of you that are tuning in, whether live or on the recording. This is Jerry Theodoro saying thank you. <laughs>